This is Sherlock's tail, in case you're wondering what's happening. <laughs> okay. Looks like everybody is here. Okay, so we'll read the Heart Sutra. Oh, I press right to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on Nasa Vulture's mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara How should any son of the lineage train? Who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom. He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shari Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell on the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhists who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassed perfect complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagawan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shari Bodhiputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandhavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. Okay. So, one thing I thought that might help clarify some of the Heart Sutra was just kind of a brief sidestep into the Tibetan language, which is related very strongly to Sanskrit. And in Tibetan, there's strangely not really a word for yes or no. <laughs> in Tibetan, the words are more not and is, if that makes sense. So in the Tibetan, where it says no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, it's saying in emptiness, there is not I, there is not ear, there is not, 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 rather than no. And somehow that can maybe help you understand more of what the sutra is getting at. Um, because it's saying that in emptiness, the nose is not the nose in and of itself. You know, there is a nose, but when you point to it, you're pointing at a part. You can't find the nose in amongst its parts. So it's like, that's not a nose, even though it's a nose. In emptiness, that's not a nose, rather than no nose. So maybe maybe just that can help a little bit when you're thinking about the Heart Sutra. Um, in English, no as a negation works, but um, in a way not could be better. So um, I don't know how it is in Hebrew, but um, hopefully that helps a little bit. And um, I highlighted a few parts in it, you might have noticed, and um, the parts I highlighted are parts that we've already talked about. So we've already talked about what the five aggregates are, we've talked about the Four Noble Truths and the Twelve Links, and, um, and gradually we'll kind of talk about the whole sutra, and um, towards the end of the semester I'll try and pull it all together. But the Heart Sutra is the middle way consequence view. It's the prasangika view. So it's the view that we're going towards, even as we start to look at different tenant schools. Um, so Heart Sutra for the day, <laughs> done. Now we'll go back to a little bit of that 12 links conversation that you had before Passover. Um, there was a question, somebody sent me an email asking, could I talk a little bit about what these words mean? Actualizing, actualized, projected, and projected, just the words themselves. So I'll do a little review of that, and then we can look at any other questions you might have had about that presentation. 
So here you go. Here's these guys. Um, so we'll just start with projecting. Okay. So in English, projecting just means extending outward beyond something else. So kind of like to launch. Um, in His Holiness and Tupton Children's book, Samsara, Nirvana, and Buddha Nature, which I think you guys would really like if you ever want to buy that book. It's fantastic. Um, the quote from there, it says, projecting means that those projecting causes are suitable to bring dukkha, suffering, after the actualizing causes come together and nourish them. So after the actualizing causes come together, these projecting factors are suffering or become suffering or bring suffering. So um, ignorance, karmic formations, and the first part of consciousness are the projecting factors. Then projected, this is cast or transmitted or what will come. Um, projected means having created the effects conducive to actualization once the actualizers, such as craving, are present. So projected is resultant consciousness, name and form, six sources, contact and feeling, kind of as a bundle. That's what's been projected. Um, you know, in a sense, it's like a past tense, whereas projecting is like in process. Um, it's not perfect, but it kind of can help just to look at the root English word. So projecting in process, projected, having been done. So actualizing means that those actualizing causes make the potency of the karmic seed powerful enough to bring the result immediately. So craving and grasping turn into becoming, which is related back to that um, second link of karma. So it's like that link of karma then turns into the link of becoming, actualizing. And then actualized means to make a reality of. So to kind of, um, here is what has been launched, birth, and then aging and death right on its heels. So those are just the words, okay? Okay, and it's easy to get lost, but when you look at it in terms of like two lives or three lives, just keep remembering the bundles, right? So the projecting and the actualizing. 
So ignorance, karmic formations, causal consciousness are created as a set. And a set of those projecting factors gets ripened by or nurtured or watered or sprouted by the actualizing factors. Craving, which escalates into grasping, which ripens the previously created karmic seeds, which lead to becoming which is karma becoming rebirth. So kind of, you know, break it into chunks so that you don't get lost. And then you have actualized or you have um, projected and actualized. So birth is actualized, wrapped with birth is the resultant consciousness, name and form, six sources, contact and feeling. And Resultant consciousness, name and form, six sources and contact. This is kind of like when the baby is in the womb growing and eventually it gets feeling and then feeling continues throughout the life, including throughout the link of aging. And then um, throughout the aging process, you create lots of bundles or collections of ignorance leading to karmic formations, the seeds of which are placed on the causal consciousness. Lots of those, which don't necessarily ripen anytime soon. And then the second part of 12 is death. And here your feeling, which has been throughout the whole life, leads to the actualizing links, craving, grasping, becoming, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So here it is all together. And I know it can look like a lot, but just kind of get clear about the two kind of split links. So at consciousness, it splits um, into life A and life B. And then at aging and death, there's a split. I don't know, is it clear how these go over a couple of lives, generally speaking, how it takes at least two lives, usually three lives for one whole set of 12 links to be completed? If you were to make an educated guess, what do you think is one of the most important links to understand? I would guess ignorance. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ignorance is key. Um, because ignorance is continuing throughout all 12 links. It's not like you have ignorance and then finish it and then move on. It's like ignorance is just bleeding through the whole thing. And if you could cut ignorance, you could cut the root of samsara, which is the whole point of studying tenets, right? Nobody's lost there, you know, or if you are lost, revive that knowing. Yeah, the point of talking about the 12 links is because we wanna cut the root of samsara to cut the root of samsara, we need to understand what ignorance is ignorant of. And it's ignorant of reality. And what is reality? There's levels of subtlety to that. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So, so ignorance is definitely a really important one. Um, what's, what's another one kind of experientially in your daily life that you think is really important to understand? Maybe craving? Yeah. Yeah. Craving for sure. For sure. And what comes before craving? I know what come after. <laughs> Which is also important, but before is more important. <laughs> Do you remember? Feeling comes before craving. Yeah. So feeling and craving is the most important juncture in our everyday experience, whether you believe in past and future lives or not, whether you understand the 12 links or not, the relationship between feeling and craving is key to breaking negative patterns. 
do you agree with that premise that if you're feeling pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, to train yourself to not react with grasping craving, to not react with aversion, and not to react with indifference, that those are separate events, but they feel like they're the same thing? Like, if I feel this way, I have to react that way. They're one moment when actually they're sequential and there's a little gap and a chance for some choice. And if we miss that chance for choice, we can keep coming back to it. But that's our everyday lived experience is I feel one way, therefore I have to do this or this or this, or I have to feel this or this or this, which is not true. You know, that's the lie we want to unpack. Just walking around, <laughs> just talking to people. So, so remember that's the key thing to kind of unravel the whole mess. Is that kind of the main thing you talk about with your patients? You can feel one way and respond differently than how you always responded? Or you just kind of hope that they'll come to that organically? Or how does it relate to your work? what you feel and your response to it. Someone sits down on the couch and they say, I'm so happy today. I feel so comfortable. I feel so pleasant today. Isn't it a beautiful day? How do you nourish their wisdom to understand that that is great and temporary and don't grasp to it because it will end? And if they assume it will be forever, and this is their life now, life is good now, starting from now, you know, that if they bank on that, if they assume that's the way it's going to be, their life is going to be full of disappointment and crushed expectations because everyone knows life is like waves. So when someone is up, how do you keep them from going too up? When someone is down, how do you keep them from going too down? How do you keep them from grasping in this habitual way? How do you do it for yourself? In uh, our therapy, it's a more uh, long distance process. So you don't, you usually don't uh, tell them right uh, when they are happy, uh, it's temporary. No. Uh, <laughs> you would be such a buzzkill, yeah. But there are, there are methods that may say, uh, maybe more CBT oriented or, but uh, uh, when you are, uh, when you are empathy, you, you have empathy uh, towards them. So uh, you may believe that during the time they won't need, uh, they will get enough uh, echo or mirroring to that need and they won't need to grasp it or to hold it too, too tight. This is one of the, maybe the methods or the process, but it, it takes time. And you may say that uh, uh, one source of the holding or the grasping is not getting enough uh, mirroring, let's say, when you needed it, it uh, uh, at the childhood or during your life and, or, the, or, or the precise mirroring. So uh, the therapy may, um do it uh, again or in a more corrected way uh, and then they won't need to grasp it so much i guess i'm just curious about how do you help them have the experience but not miss the meaning you know it's like you're holding them in this beautiful way with this mirroring and while you're holding them they can be really up and not go too far with it. They can be down and not fall into a pit, but do they understand how to then articulate that back to themselves and then integrate it personally? Is, is the idea that you just do it often enough that they just organically start to integrate that ability within themselves without even realizing it? Or are they able to explain what's going on for themselves to themselves? And I just always wonder, do they feel like uh, they're in charge of the process or is the process happening to them? Or both or neither. 
I, I think that it's a lot of times it depends on the patient and some people it's too much like intellectualizing it. So sometimes they don't need to know the process in a sense. Some people need to know, some people don't. But uh, more importantly is what Uwe is saying is that the process is happening. They have, the, they have our presence that is kind of a, a buffer between, the, I think that is like the, the space that you're talking about, the, mm. that place that they can, they, can, they can lie on the couch and think about what's happening in life in a sense. And through our, the space that is created with us in some way, it's, it's complex. I have to think how to explain it, but <laughs> complex. Like you're giving their space back to them. You're giving their chance for choice kind of back to them or something by creating this safe atmosphere. Not it, quite. No, I, 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 it's a whole, I think it's our the presence that they have like a chance to... Um, somebody there with them to kind of see them and feel. I think it gives more space, less action sometimes. Um, again, it depends on the patient, but maybe somebody yeah. else can help. Yeah, no, that, ma that makes sense. That some people um, need to know what's happening to them and some people are just happy for it to happen. <laughs> I think that maybe some it's point like, oh, Dorit, do you want to speak? No, no. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Rana first, then Dorit. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, I think it's an important uh, stage uh, where where you can where you can hear uh, your patient start to explain himself to himself in the same way or in in the in this in this light in which you, you created with him together in the same this mm -hmm. validating ex, uh, explanatory way which is not just ju judgmental or uh, mm -hmm. or uh, you know um um the 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 the, the when this happens, this is how I react. Of course, I reacted this way because this happened in my life and so on. So I think this kind of uh, development allows uh, more space and less reactivity. Yeah. Um, so it becomes Helps. a language. I think that the language that you, uh, the, your inner narrative is is becoming like a sponge that can absorb you know the pressure or the urge or the impulse to to be you know to 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 react or to be impulsive so um th this is something that starts to happen after a long time sometimes but it happens and so we, you become more uh, resilient or more you know stable mm -hmm. in in your experience in your experiencing even if you are experiencing you know serious blows it, it sounds like um in the beginning of analysis it's like you're just letting someone explain their autopilot you know they're there you know you have this expression right it, it, something to be on autopilot, just automatically going, it's same old thing. And by just kind of like witnessing their autopilot, they start to notice chances to change the system just by someone else hearing it kind of a thing. Cause I mean, really that's what the 12 links is just describing is our autopilot. And it doesn't have to be that automatic, but it is so far because of habit. But Dori, did you want to add something? I wanted yeah. to say that when I have maybe uh, an, an example, um, not an example, um, a metaphor. When you have um, enough oxygen, so you you feel uh, calm and relax. You don't you don't uh, you don't have a craving. I think that the craving come when something is not balanced in your psychic so um 
the method it, it, there is two stage the first we 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 understand no, it's not understand it's um you understand what happened to to the client and after you 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 try to explain him the genetic problem that that the that came from his childhood is that always necessary do you really have to know why um yes it, it, it always it, uh, not, I'm just not curious, always. right? Because it's it's very different from Buddhism. We say you will never get to the end of the rabbit hole, you know, because the beginning is ignorance, you know. So just assume that's where the problem started, and then everything else is variations on a theme. And it helps to know that your mother neglected you, but it's not like that's the whole reason for anything. But do you do you, you not agree? You feel like you can nail it down to just one thing created just one behavior, and it's that direct it's never only one thing it's always moment and moment and moment and moment and i think it's it's uh, it's like in buddhism in buddhism it's always changing because we meet every uh, and um, a lot of uh, people and uh, we have a lot of uh, um, um different experience experience we we learn new things. We see art, and uh, it's it's um, a complex. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we, we learn the um, uh, concept of uh, Amy talked about it a lot about the inner being. And uh, so I think maybe uh, the um, analyst is like an like this function of, of an of an inner being who is with introspection uh, and empathy also also to himself and maybe the patient didn't have the environment or the caretakers that uh, were. Um, uh, um, giving him the the con the conditions that he needed to grow uh, or or to have this space. So and maybe like the mother uh, reacted uh, with panic to to something or or neglected or and then and then he uh, the analyst uh, uh, react is is uh, is. Like you said, he he he's with he's he can be with a uh, with more space and introspection and empathy towards him, also towards himself and towards the 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 patient and the patient can uh, and with uh, and with uh, immersion with with uh, with the patient and with and uh, um, hopefully being more um, able. To to a fine attunement to it, to his needs and then it's like maybe schematic but but uh, the so the patient can uh, can slow slowly slowly uh, and mo and um, moment by moment can left uh, name uh, how do you say left name ma internalize internalized the fun the, this function so I like that what you said that uh, also he can internalize the function of being empathy or or being joyful towards towards him so uh, so it's so I like it the way you, you the the ideas that here were uh, to, to bring him or what you said also to bring him give him back the space the space, made the space that he didn't have, and he couldn't build build himself. Uh, and... Yeah. And oh, thanks for that. So the the inner being, I understand. It's it's a uh, um, it's with the uh, summer understanding of it's with understanding of emptiness and uh, 
So hopefully the, we, we also as, analy as analysts understand, have some, some uh, um, gra grasp of, of this concept. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's just somehow, when we get into the kind of complex mechanisms of samsara, or the complex mechanisms of a psychoanalytic encounter, the danger is that we could think, now I have the map, and now I have all of the details, or I have all of the reasons why, and you will never have all of the reasons why. You know, there's a famous Virginia Woolf quote, it's my favorite quote, she says, for nothing was simply one thing. Yeah, nothing was ever one thing. Nothing is one thing. There's never one reason for anything. And you could have, you know, two siblings, twin siblings with the exact same parenting and the same genetics, and they come out with two different personalities. So, so the danger is that we fall too much into, you know, now I understand why. And yet it's still important to understand why, <laughs> you know, there's some whys that you can start to look at, but not to fall into the trap of thinking all of them. Um, but Orna, did you want to add something earlier? No, okay, yeah. Miki. Yeah, yeah, Miki. Hi, um, I think that the Buddhism and psychoanalysis is it's complementary in a way, because in the psychoanalysis, we have the trans transference and we lean on the transfers between the patient and the analyst. And in self-psychology, it's self-object self transfers, transfer sex. So it's like the patient is enlarged by the presence of the analyst and he can a little by little uh, uh, get back, like uh, Talias said before, his the potential space to observe with the analyst and to be linked to him, to his selfhood. But I think that um, in, uh, in psychoanalysis, it's the, the two people who have become one, in a way, in a way. They are differentiated, but they become one. They, it's, it's so, like I think that when you talk about uh, the teachers, there is also trans to your teacher in Buddhism, the guru. So there is their transference, but it's not, it's not, we, it's not, it's not works through. Also, also in psychoanalysis, sometimes we lean on it, on the presence of it. But this is the difference. I don't think that in psychoanalysis, we also, we are striving to know the big reasons. There are many reasons and conditions, but somehow when we see the large picture, uh, the patient can be more compassionate with himself and to feel that he's more in charge and to feel that he can uh, get free for the uh, uh, habits, little by little, with the presence of the analyst. So I think in a way it's complementary, it's not contradictory. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's contradictory either. I think there's the same danger in both, which is to think that if you have an elaborate explanation, it's the whole explanation, you know? That's the danger in any school of thought, especially as you become more refined in your knowledge. Um, and it can kind of interrupt the creativity of the present moment. If you think you know what's going on before you start the session, if you know what you're gonna do before you start the session, you know, you, but you still need, techniques and options and background, but not tightly held, you know? And, and that's the same on your meditation cushion as it is next to the couch. You have your plan, but then you let it go. I also think that when the patient becomes more empathic or compassionate towards himself, he also becomes more compassionate towards his, his parents. And also theoretically when, uh, God speaks also about the, the self-objects or the parents. So also they had their uh, problems. It's not that they are to be blamed for. So it's like end, endless, but uh, uh, not endless uh, maybe, but interdependent. Yuri, you had something? Yeah, also the knowledge of uh, samsara and uh, the ultimate reality is uh, 
compatible with the, the two notions of to be yourself and to be beyond yourself or selfhood, which is very close to be uh, interconnected with everything. So uh, when we listen to a patient, uh, we may uh, hear both potentials, his potentials to be himself and his potential to be beyond himself, a part of something that is uh, wider. And when you echo that, and when you allowed him to be sometimes one with you, uh, you can you can make the transformation to that direction, which is resembles the direction to maybe the ultimate reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a nice way of looking at it. It's it, it it's like oh I don't know how to explain. It's, it's somehow like you need to say to yourself again and again, oh, that's why, but that's not why. <laughs> oh, that's why, but that's not why. You know, form is empty, emptiness is form. You know, and you can't really do without either. You know, you need both always, you know, to be able to land on a conclusion and then let go of the conclusion. And when we're starting to unpack identity and ignorance that is the root of samsara, the first of the 12 links, it's not, uh, it's not not knowing, it's knowing wrongly, right? There's lots of kinds of ignorance, but this ignorance is knowing wrongly who yourself is. And so if you can say, okay, I'm like this because of this and this and this and this, but that's not really why, <laughs> but you still have to say it. You know, it's like anything about you that has been either neglected, celebrated, or hated becomes like a defining characteristic, doesn't it? But if those particular things were just kind of embraced and loved, you might not even notice them about yourselves. You know, like whatever the length of our ears are, like no one cares about ears. So we don't think about our ears as a defining characteristic. <laughs> But if suddenly people with, you know, four inch ears were seen as very intelligent, we would become obsessed with our ears. So it's like right now we have them, no big deal, but they're not an identity feature. Easy. But then as soon as you start to think of something like your ethnicity or your gender or whatever, then because those things are either hated or celebrated, then they become defining characteristics but they're not inherently so. They're just the same as your ears. It's like, yes, you have them. Yes, they're those sizes, but they don't mean anything in and of themselves, right? And so the ignorance that leads to the karmic formations, it's again and again, you misunderstand yourself and then you act from that misunderstanding and then you plant the seed to do it again and again and suffer because of it. And so this is the thing we have to understand mainly from the 12 links, right? Is you misunderstand yourself, you act from that place, you plant the seed to do it again and suffer because of it. And again, <laughs> and again, and again. So whether you can stop planting the seed or stop making the seed or stop the misunderstanding, whatever direction you want to go to, all of it starts to interrupt the pattern. And it's really like, just pick a place to change the, the pattern. It doesn't even matter where, just do something different. <laughs> Think about it differently, but don't get so far out in your thinking that it's at the expense of sanity or ethics. And that's the tricky thing with the middle way consequence view, which is that it's so close to nihilism that you could fall over the cliff, but it's not because it's never at the expense of ethics. And that the stronger your understanding of emptiness, the stronger your ethics, they're even more thoroughly reinforced because the only logical conclusion from emptiness is a non-harmful way of being because of the infinite interconnectedness of things. Why would you hurt something that's connected to you and will then come back and hurt you? It doesn't make sense anymore. Rather than framing it as a good person doesn't do this, does do that in a kind of like oversimplistic way. 
it comes from this deep rationale of it doesn't make sense to hurt each other if we're all connected, just like it doesn't make sense for the hand to hurt the foot. So is it starting to kind of come together? Yeah, I wanted to ask a question sure. about emptiness and love and compassion. And if, if you're, um, it's something that I've been thinking about for a while and um, heard a couple of answers that people talk about it, but if you, um, you're more and more focusing on emptiness, like you say, and if everything is interconnected, why do we continue um, practicing compassion or working on compassion in a sense? Because why do we need both wings? Because if we're in emptiness, we're going to be get there anyways. Like you say, ethics is inherent is part of it. It's it comes up. You can't if you're interconnected. Everybody is so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. And like eventually, it all comes into one, and it all just boils down to realizing emptiness you behave in an ethical way without having to stop and think about it first but i think to have the willpower to want to understand emptiness directly you have to see how not understanding emptiness makes you suffer and makes you hurt people so it's like you're working on this method side in your everyday experience even though it's based in conventional truth even though conventional truths are deceptive by nature still there are experience and they're all we've ever known. And so to come closer to emptiness, we reinforce compassion and ethics in a, you know, kind of like a top down sort of, you know, not totally wise, not totally skillful way, but it gives us enough momentum to go on to realize emptiness. Because without, I think, recognizing where suffering comes from, or recognizing where our harmful behaviors come from, it's like, uh, life's not that bad. <laughs> Why put in the effort to realize emptiness? Why put in all of that effort to, to end samsara until you kind of cosmically understand how profound the suffering is because of not understanding it? So it's like the method gives fuel to the wisdom. And then eventually you give fuel to both until then it kind of tips over into only fueling one and that just kind of reinforces everything else. So I think it's kind of a sequential thing. But bodhicitta, I think, gives you a more powerful reason to practice. Because if it was just for yourself, life's not that bad. <laughs> you know, you can find a way to make samsara bearable, right? You've got friends, you've got family, you've got food. You know, you can like make it fun for yourself. But if you think right now, you know, in load, there are people suffering so cosmically, so fundamentally, absolute breakdown in relationships, breakdown in society, breakdown in sanity, and we can only help a little bit, which is fantastic, but we could help more if we had a deeper understanding of reality. We would help so much more. And so our radius of impact would increase if our own abilities were stronger. So then you think it is worth my while to put all this time and effort in for their sake. Maybe it's not worth it for me. Maybe I'm okay, <laughs> but I really could do more for them. I don't know if that, that helps, but you know, sometimes it, it, it can help also to recognize we could suffer less than we do if we understood reality better. Yeah, just our everyday experience of like annoyance and irritability and grumpiness or just like ennui, sort of melancholy, sadness, just those little like passing moods that aren't that big a deal. We actually don't have to have that. You know, suffering's not inevitable. <laughs> and um, so remembering that can kind of give our power to our practice. And the more that you do these practices, the more kind of deep contentment you find and then it's reinforcing because you see it works. But it's gradual. <laughs> Rona, something? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask uh, why is um, contact considered uh, project projected, right? Projected. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Why is it projected? Why is it, pro yeah, why is it not uh, um, in the actualizing or, uh, or actualized category? Why is it, why is it projected? Well, it's part of the rebirth, right? It's so, you know, so think of, it's all in a way um, within the womb of a baby in the case of a human rebirth, right? It's easier to think in terms of human rebirth because that's what we're familiar with. So birth is meeting of consciousness, sperm and egg. Those three coming together is birth. And that's the resultant consciousness, right? And with the resultant consciousness, it's not like it's just a little consciousness floating around in there without any work to do. It's, you know, building arms and legs and sense faculties and things like that. And so with the consciousness is name and form, which are the five aggregates. And they're like, you know, not all of them are awake and activated until the form of the baby is kind of coming together. So as the form of the baby's coming together, the six sources or like the houses for the different senses start to come into being. And once you have those like gateways of the senses, then the outside world is able to meet the inside world and you have contact. And as soon as you have contact, you have a feeling about that. So that bundle, the projected bundle is kind of like, just your womb experience. And then once you're born out of the womb of your mother, you know, what we would call birth, but actually birth happened way back at conception. After you're born, then you have feeling. And from feeling, everything else comes into play throughout your life. And because feeling is conditioned by ignorance, we're creating karma all the time. So that bundle is your rebirth bundle. Does that, does that make sense? Ish? So in a way it's like more passive, whereas the other ones are more active. Like we can't decide to have contact. We just, we have contact now. We can't decide to have feeling, we have feeling now. But we can decide what we do with our feeling. So it's kind of a passive, active, finished, unfinished, un, you know, for lack of a better word, situation. Did you say that the feeling are conditioned to the ignorance? Or I didn't yeah. understand. Yes? Well, everything is conditioned by ignorance, including feeling. Conditioned to or by? It's different? By. By. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a feeling all the time and we have ignorance all the time, which is why we have craving and grasping, which is why we create karma and plant the seed on the causal consciousness, right? So the links are like all nice and tidy in their circle, but then when you start talking about them, they're all different ways of grouping them and it can get confusing. But, you know, there's a lot of different ways to group them to understand kind of our everyday experience of them. But if you think, all right, what I'm feeling right now, okay, physically and mentally came from the past. How I respond to it creates my future. Whether you believe in karma or not, that's quite true, yes? But the illusion is that what you're feeling right now is 100% about this moment only. That's an illusion though, isn't it? Never mind Buddhism, like what you're feeling now is not about now, 100%. If you didn't know how to speak English, you'd have a different experience that came from the past. If you didn't know about psychoanalysis, if you didn't like ideas, if you didn't like this group, if blah, 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 right? Like it's all conditioned by many, many things, but all of which have ignorance. Yeah, the ignorance that things, thinks that things are just as they seem. So, you know, to make it simple, it's not that having opinions is the problem that your op opinions are self-evident and concrete is the problem or that you have the whole story ever because we never do but but we um we we cultivate the the 
the the six perf perfection or every good uh, kind of, um, uh, action we do to to promote the good karma right mm -hmm. the, yep. the good seeds it's yeah. it's like a, a war between uh, good seeds and bad seeds right <laughs> Or it's a mess <laughs> between good seeds and bad seeds. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I mean, even the good seeds have ignorance, don't they? Right. Which is why they still lead to rebirth in samsara, just rebirth in the upper realms. You know, so that's why we want this whole wisdom mission so that we're not creating um, ignorantly based good karma anymore, that we start to develop pure karma. But, you know, right now, none of our karma is free from ignorance. Even we do the nicest thing possible with the best motivation possible. It's still contaminated by self-cherishing and self-grasping. Totally. We just kind of like know that and manage that. You know, and work on it and adjust it and, you know, keep correcting the motivation. It's like we know what we want our motivation to be. It is our motivation, but then self-cherishing like tries to co-opt it and say, oh, I'm such a good person because of that. And you go, oi, oi, you out. And, you know, refresh again and again. And so the more that we do that, the more habitual it becomes, but also the less likely we are to fall into the trap of thinking that we are a good person or a bad person in a sort of concrete branded way that leads to defensiveness. Because we know we're neither and we're both, <laughs> you know. So uh, the Buddha won't have feelings or he won't believe or he won't grasp the feelings. He will only have feelings related to uncontaminated karma. So the experience of a Buddha is only bliss. Only bliss, like a stable? Stable bliss. But, you know, remember that the Buddha, like so many religious traditions, you know, was once a human being who understood suffering, who experienced suffering, who did the wrong thing, who made mistakes. And so despite the fact that the Buddha is like in this blissful mental experience only, they're still able to relate to the suffering of sentient beings because they remember it, you know, but they can bear witness to the worst suffering imaginable and it doesn't give them suffering to see it. So they're not clouded, they can 100% help. You know, there's part of us that sometimes thinks if we see suffering, we have to also suffer. Like it's like a good person suffers if they see suffering as if that helps, you know, but we have that strange belief. A Buddha can see it and hold it and not make it about them. You know, sometimes when we suffer with someone else's suffering, we're like making it about us. Right. I mean, it's basic, you know, this You're, you know, you, you've been doing this work a long time, but sometimes when we have like empathic distress, we call it compassion fatigue and there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. There's empathic distress for sure. There's, you know, overly identifying with someone else's suffering and making it somehow about you or your job to fix or over identification with it or whatever, whatever. And then we get exhausted and it's only human, but there's no such thing as compassion fatigue if it's actually compassion, which is why a Buddha is not ever suffering when they bear witness to suffering in terms of their conditions and then their causes, they've eliminated all the causes for suffering in their continuum. So there is no causes to water. Slowly, slowly, right? <laughs> slowly, slowly, right? So um, for your reading, um, this book has a really excellent introduction. It's a very clear introduction. I recommend you read it if you can but I'm just going to read you a couple pages from chapter one, just so that we start looking at um, dependent arising more generally than just the 12 links, and then we'll finish up. So we're on page 15 um, in your hard copy, which I think is something like what page five in the PDF. So it says, oops, dependent arising means that phenomena are dependent on other factors. 
causes, and conditions in order to come into existence. This way of existing automatically dispels the extreme view of permanence because a dependent arising comes into existence in dependence on other factors, and so therefore cannot be independent, permanent, or truly existent. So if you make a mental note, independent, permanent, or truly existent don't mean the same thing. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that, but just in case you're mixing them together. Also, dependent arising contradicts non-existence because if something exists in dependence on other factors, having come into existence in this way, it cannot be completely non-existent. So within the understanding of dependent arising lies the power to dispel the two extreme views of true existence and complete non-existence. So then I'm going to go down and just look at this section. There are three main meanings of the first word dependence. The first meaning of dependence is meeting or coming together. The second meaning is reliance, as in something being contingent on something else. The third meaning is dependence as we would generally understand it, something being dependent on something and therefore not independent. So this section here, we're going to unpack a little more, but if you want to read ahead, chapter one, um, go ahead, um, at least those first couple of pages. Okay, so we're just going to unpack what does it mean to be dependent and um, remembering that dependent arising is your access into emptiness. If you understand dependent arising, you can touch the reason for emptiness. Okay, so we'll dedicate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be free. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Okay, thanks guys. And um, if you had questions that come up um, that you weren't able to ask in class, you can always send me an email and I'll try and bring them up in class.